Okay. Are you ready? As I'll ever be. Okay. I give you full permission to judge me. And listeners, I mean, y'all... I was going to judge you anyway with or without your permission. So. <laughs> uh, and listeners, y'all can judge me too. All right. Here we go. Trinidad and the big Mississippi and the town Honolulu and the Lake Titicaca. The Pope of Ca- the po- Stop. Don't laugh at me. Ah! Titicaca. Sorry. The Popo Catep- Cap. No, I always I always say that wrong. Um, is not in Canada, but rather in Mexico, 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 Canada, Malaga, Remini, Brennessy, Canada, Malaga, Remini, Brennessy. Yes, Tibet, 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 Nagasaki, Yokohama, Nagasaki, Yokohama. What a to do to die today at a minute of two till two. A thing distinctly hard to say, but harder still to do. A rat tattoo at a two till two, and a rat tattoo till two, and the dragon will come when you hear the. When he hears the drum in a minute or two, minute or two till two today at a minute or two till two. End scene. <laughs> that was just a bunch of fucking gibberish. I got nervous. Yeah. When I was editing the last this last episode... And we were doing the tongue twisters. Mm-hmm. I it just came to me the like the first half of the geographical <laughs> uh, fugue, and and so then I looked it up so I could remember the rest. And then this morning I was reciting it to myself, getting ready to say it to you. And that second part, the uh, what did to do to die today, just popped into my head, and I had forgotten that that is also like we would say we would say the first one with all the capitals. That's the geographical fugue. Mm-hmm. And I don't know, some some famous composer or, or some shit came up with it back in the nineteen thirties. <laughs> anyway, and then after that we lead right into the Yeah, what did to do to die today at a minute of two t- minute or two till two. So, well, it was very entertaining. Virtual, Reminded me of the Animaniacs thing. <laughs> what? The Animaniacs thing where they talk about all the countries. Um, I the vaguely Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I used to be able to say the whole thing, and I can't anymore because I'm adult. I'm adult. Hello. Hi. Hi, Corey. Hello, Kobe. Um, welcome, listeners. This is Booked on a Feeling, a podcast where we talk about our books. Episode five. Feelings. Yeah, it's episode five. Disclaimer. This episode might have some triggers in it. This is triggering. Um, we're talking about incest today. Yes. Kind of in a funny haha, but also I've I've put together, I've compiled some education on the subject. <laughs> Thank you. Being the true nerd and, you know, just neurotic person that I am, I figured that we'd need a little bit of background info. Okay. Do so. you want to um okay, well then do you want to just I don't know. How's your day going? <laughs> besides it's researching, going <laughs> uh, besides researching incest and and doing all that stuff with your Google history, it's going good. My Google and my Kindle history are fucked at this point. So, but I mean, Man, ever since we started this five podcast, episodes in, well, to well, our new, yeah, newer episodes. I really hope that my analytics don't like show up on Facebook and I start getting like requests to join incest groups. Really hope. Do that those exist? Happen because incest everything is exists. legal is illegal everything is legal exi- incest is legal everything exists on the internet what is that rule what's the rule rule 34 about the porn right uh-huh yeah let's yep. not go down that road we're not gonna go down that road again <laughs> okay um where do we want to start uh i guess we could just do some icebreakers okay so i'll go first mine's not topic related because yeah i just for reasons um what celebrity did you idolize as a child what celebrity did i idolize carrie fisher carrie fisher mm-hmm. yeah leia yeah nice Princess leia general organa huge star wars nerd over here i would i would have said natalie portman but i also have a crush on her which is why my cat's name is Padme after the yeah you know yeah effervescent role. 
effervescent. I didn't, Played by Natalie I Portman. Didn't know, I didn't know when that word was going to come up again, exactly. but there it came. There it is. There it is. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, I would say Carrie Fisher, um, may she rest in peace. She was an amazing woman. She went through her struggles, but um, I think I think she's uh, she's made quite an impact. So. Yeah, I think so too. What about you? Um, so my celebrity like icon is kind of it's kind of weird. Uh, Nicholas Cage for one one role specifically. Okay. I'm I'm going to judge you really hard if it's oh he wasn't what I think it is. he wasn't my favorite character by any no, means. No, no, but, but like. Um, what national treasure? Oh, okay, that I approve of. What did you think it was? I thought it was gonna be like when he was Ghost Rider, when he was. Oh no, that movie was awful. Doing the knowing, that movie. I never the saw knowing, the knowing. Thoroughly pissed me off. But um, yeah, no, I was obsessed with National Treasure, so I think Nick Cage, like I idolized him. I wish as, it was real. As yeah, exactly. As a child, I'm sure there are other celebrities that I really idolized, but. I block off those parts of my memory so. <laughs> for good reason. <laughs> so I don't. <laughs> so anyway, all right, you go. What is your question? Okay, so I'm going to give you a t- teensy bit of information before I ask my question because my question ties into my information. Okay. So because I'm curious, because I'm madly into psychology, the Oedipus complex, I think we all are kind of familiar with the idea of it um, proposed by Sigmund Freud, who suggested that. Well, and and based off of Oedipus Rex, right? Based it's named after the Oedipus Rex play and how he was feeling as he was watching and reading that play. Okay. Freud proposed that Oedipal desire is a universal psychological phenomenon innate to human beings And that this complex manifests during the phallic stage of which children become aware of their body. So that's puberty. um, uh, Actually, it's when ages three to six, when they discover like their body, Oh, when they when they're aware of their of their anatomy, anatomy. Yeah. Okay. so this is he says that ages three to six is when the formation of the libido and ego occurs, but it could manifest even earlier. In his opinion, it happens between ages three and six. There is a positive and a negative Oedipus complex. The positive is the unconscious, a child's unconscious desire for the opposite sex parent and hatred for the same sex parent. Okay. Negative is the child's unconscious sexual desire for the same sex parent and hatred for the opposite sex parent. Interesting. Yes. I mean, both are bad. Can we, can we agree on that? There isn't a positive. Uh, That's not positive. We'll get there. We'll get there. Because um, is he talking about like sexual desire yes. here? Then how? Okay. We'll get there. Okay. I promise. Give me a sec. Okay. <laughs> so, um, Carl I'm just Gustav, so ready to condemn. Okay? I know. Just let me condemn. <laughs> Carl Gustav Jung, who is another philosopher, proposed that the term, quote, Oedipic, Oedipus complex is only used to denote a boy's psychosexual development. And he uses electric complex for girls. Okay. Which is another... Greek. It's another character from a Greek play yeah, by yeah. Sophocles who plotted matricidal revenge with her brother. See, and that's probably where electoral love comes from then, because yes. we were looking up synonyms for incest. Electoral love, yeah. There's also another man named um, Westermark, and he suggests, and this is called the Westermark effect, and he suggests that... Um, People who live in close domestic proximity for the first few years of their lives become desensitized to sexual attraction. Um, Edvard Westermark, by the way. Um, And he also calls this reverse sexual imprinting. So while Freud argued that as children, members of the same sex family or members of the same family naturally lust for one another, Westermark argued the reverse, that the taboos themselves arise naturally as a product of, like, innate attitudes. Does that make sense? You lost me there at the end. But from what I understood, Westermark is saying, essentially, after the honeymoon phase, people lose sexual attraction after being next to each other? So Freud argues that it's natural lust and that the taboo comes later. Okay. Westermark says 
the taboo is there and the desire comes after the taboo. So in other words, because it's forbidden, that's what drives. Yes. Like the, okay. the incest feelings, the incestuous feelings. So there's a lot. I was so that's only like chipping the paint. I was going to say, I don't really want to go down this no, road. We're, no, 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 no. Trust me. I went down a far road. I just wanted to give like a little bit of background of like the different types of things because um, I don't know exactly what book you're doing, but my book kind of my book does not really involve the Oedipus complex, but it's in the realm. Yeah, mine's in the realm, too. Yeah, yeah. but I just wanted to like give a little bit of background. Like I said, this is just scratching the surface. There are many books. There are many TED Talks about all of this, about pedophilia, about incestual relation, relationships. It's crazy how much people have made, like, have talked about this. My icebreaker question to you, knowing all this information, kind of, that I just gave you. Okay. Why do you think that we believe this is so abhor- abhorrent? Why do you think this is a taboo? Um, I believe that it's derived from, honestly, from like almost natural selection, children or offspring born of parents who are related are naturally weaker. Mm -hmm. And so just over time, it's something in our, in our subconscious or unconscious mind that makes us just see, see it through that lens where it's like, you know, no, because Um, A lot of psychologists have said whenever you look at the opposite sex, you're sizing them up in terms of how your offspring are going to turn out a lot. Like for me, that's where I think that taboo comes from is because it's like um, our offspring are not going to make it Mm -hmm. in your subconscious or unconscious mind. I and that that's how I think it started. I think that's how the taboo started. And I think we've just um, built on it from. Yeah, pretty much. See, and I kind of disagree with you i think i think so naturally i mean we're animals evolution exists sorry if we lost a bunch of listeners evolution exists animals in the wild don't care whether it's their brother sister cousin mother father whatever they're just they're just naturally urged to mate so i think that the taboo comes from humans being cognizant enough I mean, to it's understand logic based. it is it's, logic yeah based. it's logic based so i i think that this taboo kind of just came around because like you said the genetic stuff that came down the line and then those types of things just started being weird i don't know but all i know is that i believe that this is a strictly human thing i don't think that animals no, I didn't. I had. I didn't say anything about I know, it I know. not being more than human. I'm. I'm genuinely saying that because, like, because your your subconscious, unconscious mind is going to have those logic, like it's going to have those routines yeah. embedded. Mm-hmm. So, but I'm saying that I think the taboo comes from humans being like, "Whoa, that's not okay," because we're cognizant enough to understand. To understand the ramifications. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Thank you. That's what I was trying to say. Okay. So. And what are those ramifications, Kobe? Uh, potential for genetic ref- uh, defects, congenital Boom. defects. We're both right then. I'm saying that it comes about a different way. Oh, okay. Well, I thought that we were... We're right in that aspect. We agree on that. I'm saying it comes about a different way. I, okay. I so, think okay. I think we both had the same thought. We just approached maybe, it from different angles. Maybe listeners tell us if we're actually just saying the same fucking thing. And, you know, whether or not the taboo does come from subroutines in your brain, I still condemn it. So I I can <laughs> I'll get to I'll get to my, oh my thoughts God. on that. Okay. Okay. Cool. All right. All right. Let's flip. That wait, hold on. Um, Corey, <laughs> I'll just do the Corey side. You I'll just keep. Side? I'll just. I'll just stay on the Corey okay. side. Flip that coin. Every time, every time you lose. I don't know. I don't know why. It's me first. Okay. All right. Okay. 
So my book that I did for this episode is called Forbidden Love by Tabitha Suzuma, published in 2011. So a little bit about Tabitha. She also has written um, A Note of Madness, A Voice in the Distance, From Where I Stand, Without Looking Back, and a whole bunch of other books. She's a very prominent author. She stopped publishing in 2013 for personal reasons, so she hasn't published anything since 2013. Okay. Um, but this was one of her most popular and controversial books. Ooh. Okay. So she used to work as a primary... I don't know why, I don't know why I'm saying ooh. We know ooh. that these books are controversial. <laughs> right? <laughs> she used to work as a primary school teacher and now divides her time between writing and tutoring. She has a blog called Writer and a, writerandddog.com. Um, she hasn't posted since 2019, but the entries are profound because she discusses her struggles with depression and is incredibly candid about her life experiences. Um, In 2011, Forbidden Love, this book, was nominated for a Carnegie Medal, a British literary award, Mm -hmm. and it also won the Premio Special Caraparma for European literature. She currently lives in London, London, London. with with her dog Misha. All right. So, and her dog's like super cute. It's like a cocker spaniel. Almost as cute as Misha Collins. I was just about to say Misha Collins, supernatural. That whole. Can we tag him? (laughs) (laughs) Can we tag him in this episode? (laughs) He's going to be like, what the fuck am I tagged in? Oh, God. (laughs) Um, Anyway. Block. (laughs) So, okay. So I kind of struggled with my notes on this one, but just. As a disclaimer, this book is told through the alternating points of view of the two main characters. Okay. So it goes back and forth, but I'm telling the story as if it's from our point of view. Okay, I see see what you're saying. Okay, go for it. So this story, Forbidden Love, is about Lachan, which I have no idea if I'm fucking pronouncing that right, but it's spelled L-O-C-H-A-N. Okay. So it's like Lachlan without the second L. Mm -hmm. And Maya Whitley, the two oldest of five children living in London. Lachlan and Maya are 17 and 16, respectively. Um, And at the beginning of the book, or they're 17 and 16 at at the beginning of the book, but they are 13 months apart in age. They live with their siblings, Kit, who's 13, Tiffin, who is, I think, eight, and Willa, who is five. They're These youngest. are all like half names. Yeah. <laughs> they're like... <laughs> yeah. It's like their parents got tired halfway through naming them. So their father, a po- who was a poet, left shortly after Willa was born and moved to Australia to start a new family. Their mother was distraught and is an alcoholic and working as a waitress. She chases her youth through her boyfriend named Dave, and her consistent absence causes Lachan and Maya to be the sole caretakers of the younger children. Okay. So it's clear in the book that the mother is terribly suited for parenting. She frequently spends the little money she makes on clubbing clothes and gifts for her boyfriend Dave. Like, she hardly ever gives her... five kids, right? Yeah, she hardly ever gives money to her children. Um, She doesn't consider the burden that she's placed on her oldest children who cook, clean, do homework with the younger kids. They do laundry. They take them to school. If something happens at school, they ask school administration to call them instead of their mother because she never answers the phone or she's always drunk or hungover. So they and they're also going to school themselves. So like lock in in the book is in his last year of school and, and he, he's 17 you yes said right. and he's okay. applying for university um in london the university of london um Lockin is a very shy boy he doesn't speak or do any presentations at school due to crippling social anxiety that is mostly brought out by the stifling fear that his siblings will be as embarrassed of him as they are of their mother so he doesn't have friends the only time that he really comes out of his shell is at home Okay. But Lockin is very bright and is the academic of the family, and um, their mom usually accuses him of being just like his father and that he'll leave the family just like his father did. 
Maya is the mother figure. She soothes all of her siblings with a kind voice and tries to keep peace in the house. Um, and at school, she's more on the chattier side, but doesn't re- reveal too much of her life. So she's really, she's outgoing, mm-hmm. but in a very superficial kind of way. Um, she's got some skeletons. Yeah. Well, her family's, her family is her skeleton. Okay. Maya has felt a connection with Lockin for her whole life. She remarks in the beginning that he's the only point of reference in her difficult existence, and she's always felt a different connection with him. She's never thought of him as her brother, but more, of, more as her best friend. Maya starts to struggle with her feelings about the girls at school, specifically her best friend, Francie, because they think that her older brother is cute, and they ask her, like, how they can get him to date them. She sounds fancy. Yeah. Lockin really struggles wow. with his anxiety. No I'm sorry. What? That wasn't funny, I guess. No, it wasn't. What do you mean? Her name's oh, Francie. Francie. Fancy Francie. That's cute. I like that. I'm going to call her that from now <laughs> Francie. Fancy Francie. <laughs> Lockin really struggles with his anxiety of not being enough for his family, for becoming like his father and leaving, or being like his mother and being an, embarrass- an embarrassing absentee parent. He feels that Maya is the only one who truly understands him and shares his burdens with him. So we're going to get into the story now. So that's just kind of like how they feel, kind of the background of like where we're at. Okay. So the troubles really begin with new teenage angst that appears in Kit. And Lockin and Maya just start having more and more pressure of raising three kids with the terrible fear that their home situation will cause social services to separate them all so the whole reason why they live the way that they live and not tell on their mom is they don't want to be separated yeah i mean that's a that's an actual fear though yeah no that's 100 percent a valid fear um kit has decided to start acting out and he hangs around gangs and smokes cigarettes and smokes weed he lashes out at lachlan Lachlan, Lachlan, when he tries to discipline Kit for his terrible behavior, Maya struggles with connecting with Kit because of the anger he has, so Kit just generally does whatever the hell he wants without care. Um, Lachlan becomes increasingly frustrated with his mother, um, beginning with her wanting to go out with her friends after spending the whole day being hungover and forgetting to pick up her two youngest kids from school. The only day that she was supposed to do it and she forgets because she's hungover. Um, Maya and Lockin have panic attacks about the whole thing. They find out that their mother had asked the neighbor to go pick up Willa and Tiffin, but mom had forgotten that she had talked to the neighbor and didn't tell Maya when she had come home. So they started the freaking the fuck there. out and they went to the school administration and they were like, where are the kids? Who the hell took them? And they find them and he's really pissed because the moment that they get home with the two kids, mom is like, I'm going to go out clubbing with Dave. Bitch. Um, Tell us how you really feel. Right? As the school term goes on, Kit becomes increasingly more and more reckless. Um, Lockin tries very hard to get his mother involved, but it doesn't work, so she tries to get him, or he tries to get her to, like, say something to Kit, seeing if maybe he'll listen to her, because Kit always has the argument of, you're not my dad, and all that shit. Um, but she refuses to do anything. One night, Kit doesn't come home. Lockin begins to panic and decides to go out and search for him in the streets, fearing that he's dead in a gutter. Kit gets home five hours past his curfew, um, and Maya is there at home to, like, greet him. And she calls Lockin when he's walking around the streets at night in London and is like, he's back. Well, Lockin gets incredibly upset because... He, like, loses his temper because he cannot believe that Kit was so careless about just leaving and not saying anything. Yeah. They get into a fight, which ends with Maya having to hold Lockin back because Lockin decides, like, in it will not decides, but in his violent rage, he starts to strangle Kit. Jeez. But, I mean, they're teenagers. Anyway, I'm not trying to justify this. Anyway. Yeah, I mean, okay. (laughs) But, um... Kit tells Lockin that he isn't his dad and that he wishes Lockin would be like the other older brothers, um, his friend's older brothers, who buy their little little brothers booze and get them into clubs, like do like big brother things. Yeah. 
Lockin, realizing what the fuck he's doing, starts having another panic attack. He's really prone to panic attacks, by the way. Um, I'm no, I'm and, picking up on that. Yeah, <laughs> and he knows logically that teenagers break curfews all the time and that parents yell and punish their kids. And he knows that they never get violent with their kids. Um, so he starts, like, really doubting himself and he starts to cry in Maya's arms and they fall asleep with their arms around each other. Okay. The next morning, Maya wakes and realizes that she never, ever wants anyone to see Lachlan the way that she saw him, like, crying. Because he doesn't cry in front of anybody. She decides that she wants to be the only one to love him and to see him that vulnerable. She convinces her mother to take the kids out for the day to give Lachlan a break from everyone. And she stays behind to keep him company. Lachlan starts doing homework at the coffee table and asks Maya to quiz him. Um, He starts getting really frustrated because he's a huge academic and he really wants to, like, succeed and be able to get into the University of London so they can make good money and he can take care of and support his family. Um, So Maya's like, I'm a free spirit and I'm going to get your mind off of everything. So she convinces him to salsa dance with her. And so they're dancing and they're having a good time in the living room. And then they end up holding each other way too closely. Lockin gets aroused. How I don't know how else to say that. He gets aroused. I don't think there's any way. There's no way. Uh, to, no other way mm, to say yep, that. Um, okay. He gets aroused and immediately shoves her away, and avoids her for literal days. Like he says, like "Hello, good morning." He goes off to school. He comes back and he's like, "Hi, good night." Doesn't talk to her. Doesn't speak to her because he's freaked out about his feelings. He says. One quote, I just forgot for one insane moment that Maya was my sister. Bum, bum, bum. <sighs> Maya, being pissed off about the whole lock and avoiding her shit, because mm-hmm. she's like, it's not a big deal. I felt it. It's not a big deal. She's like, I'm going to go get a boyfriend to get my mind off of lock and like secretly also trying to make him jealous. So she finds a boy or a, I guess a boy finds her because it's like one of the cutest guys in Lockin's grade. So she's, he's a year older than her and he like come and he's inviting her to on a date Friday night to go have dinner. And he's like a rich kid. She goes on a date with him and she has great time. But when he drops her off, she realizes that this boy will always be second best. So she tells him like, sorry, we can only be friends. I can't have a relationship right now. She gets home and Lockin is like pacing around the living room. He's freaking the fuck out. And he he's thinking this whole time, like, she's probably sleeping with him. They're probably fucking right now. How dare she go out and fuck somebody? How dare she? I mean, he has no business. That never mind. I'm not even Yeah, I know. <laughs> um, so she gets home and they have a fight. They have a fight because he's like, Did you sleep with him? Did you kiss him? Did you fuck him? That's probably why you're so late, right? Because you were fucking him. And she's like, no, we literally did nothing. We didn't even hug. I came, I went to dinner and I came home. That was it. And he's like, I don't believe you. And she's like, well, believe this. And she grabs his face and she kisses him. Well, they start making out. And then he freaks out and is like, this is so incredibly wrong. But I love you. Let's do more of this. So they are like, let's stop doing this to ourselves because the fear of anybody finding out would have their siblings taking, taken away. Um, so they're like, let's not do this. We had this kiss. We had this makeout sesh. Let's stop. We need to stop. It's not right. It's not cool. So they both agree that they're going to go find other people. So... Lock in is like, Maya, go get me together with Fancy Francie. Get me a date with her because she's been salivating, like chomping at the bit to get with him and tells her to go back to the guy, that the rich kid that she just went on a date with. So the next day, Maya is in school and she's supposed to talk to Fancy Francie about getting a date with her, with Lachlan. Lachlan. Can't fucking talk. <laughs> And Maya just is sick to her stomach. She's like, I don't want to do this. 
I have no desire to do this. So Maya's like, I'm just going to go talk to him and be like, I can't do this. We should be together. So on her way to running to lock in on the other side of the school, she falls down a flight of stairs. Jesus. It was an accident. She didn't get pushed. She's, she just like wasn't paying she's attention. She's so excited to get to her forbidden love. That she <laughs> just takes a tumble. Yeah. God damn. Um, so <laughs> she goes to the nurse's office and Lockin comes in and is like, I'm her older brother. I'm taking her home right now because like she might have a concussion and she's got bruises and she's bleeding. So he takes her home and they get home and Maya's like, I can't do this. The reason why I fell down those stairs was because I was coming for you. And Lockin's like, honestly, the only reason why I saw you in the stairwell was because I was coming was for because you. I was coming for you. OK, so they're like, we can't fight these feelings. So they should try to be together in secret. Can't fight the feelings. So this results in a and I tried to be punny with this an explosive explosive exchange wink that's disgusting <laughs> no penetration <laughs> oh my you did <laughs> i don't know how to word a lot of these things it made me very uncomfortable reading these parts the other parts are really sweet but she flogged the bishop actually no they had all their clothes on oh okay they were just you know they were dry humping. So, I don't know how else to say it. Okay. Being blunt. Uh, okay. And thus begins the sordid love affair. I wrote that. <laughs> you um, wrote it with that with that panache too. Yeah. That. <laughs> I put it like in all italics. Um so a couple months go by and they're like seeing each other in secret and stuff. Like only when the kids go to bed and only in the living room with the door closed, like they don't do nothing else. They just make out. So after a couple months, it's Christmas and Lockin gives Maya a silver bracelet with an inscription that says like, I'll love you forever. XO Lockin. And it was like incredibly adorable because he's super nervous. It's kind of like when you give your significant other a gift for the first time and you're like, oh my gosh, I really hope that you like, like it. If I you don't, that that's like okay. It. If you don't, that's okay. I'll take it back or you can, I don't know, put it in a box somewhere. I'm not sure. And she's like crying because she loves it so much yeah um and so a couple days after that maya convinces her mother again to take the the rest of the kids out for the day as a surprise for lock-in as her christmas gift to him because they don't they don't exchange gifts they only ever buy gifts for the for the younger kids um she catches him off guard in his room when he's got a towel on and they start making out and she touches his special place. His no-no square. His no-no square. She shouldn't go there. Which causes him to jump back and he's like, what the fuck is wrong with you? This is disgusting. You shouldn't be touching me there. You have no business touching me there. We, this is gross. This is illegal. We could get, we could go to jail. Finally, one of them's thinking clearly. And so he like hurries up and gets dre- gets dressed and he runs out of the house And she follows him down the street and they end up um, in a graveyard and have a huge argument about the whole situation about like, she's like, well, why did you tell me that you loved me if you think it's disgusting? And he's like, well, because it's illegal and I can't help my feelings. But like you touched me in a place that you shouldn't like we we could go to jail and we could lose the kids. And so it kind of all comes to a, a head with Maya saying like good thing you don't want to do this anymore because I don't love you anymore. And she walks away. And uh, Lockin, Lockin goes into a tailspin. So for like a week afterwards, he's just in a daze, like going through the motions. He's like, I can't believe she would say that. Oh my God. And like, he's heartbroken. So a week later, he's in English class and they start discussing Hamlet and Ophelia and the Oedipus <sighs> complex, which the whole time that the teacher's discussing it, he's having an internal panic attack. <laughs> what did I say about <laughs> teen lit? 
there is always some <laughs> goddamn book that they're reading that That's just relevant to, the relevant to their yep. whole lives yep. and everything they've ever experienced. Oh, I knew that that would get the you. Worst. I knew that would get you. So tired. Well, he starts having like he's like having heart palpitations. His breath is cutting off like he's on the verge of tears in the middle of class because he's like oh my god did the teacher bring this up because she knows about me and maya and what we did and oh my god we're all gonna go to jail holy shit ah ah so he's like comatose right now well i guess not really coma comatose because he's alert he's just like frozen and they i'm actually really impressed just sidebar i'm really impressed that the author was able to write through a panic attack. Like, she accurately she depicted... it? Yeah, she... she I mean, because she's probably basing it off of... Experience, yeah. yeah. But, like, she very accurately put us into a panic attack. And I was... I was, like, starting to... My breath was starting to get quick because I was like, oh, my God, that's how I feel when I have a panic attack. Holy shit. So I was really impressed with that, like, that little... That she was able to put it into words. Yeah, into that writing. she was able mm-hmm. to put those feelings into words. So he has his incredibly severe panic attack, and the school calls Maya, the teacher calls Maya into the classroom because she's like, I don't know what's wrong with him. Can you help him? And Maya's like, Well, he's just having a panic attack. I'll take him home because obviously they're brother and sister. Yeah. Um. So she takes him home. They get into the living room. They're by themselves because mom's at work or with Dave or something. Honestly, they don't know half the time where she is. I mean, at this point, who cares? At this point, yeah. At this point, who cares? And Lockin is just like, or Maya asks what happened, and Lockin is like, I just want to know, did you mean what you said in the in the cemetery? Because that's all I've been thinking about for days, and I just need to know. And she's like, no, I completely made it up. I just, I thought you wanted to end it, so I... She wanted to hurt him. Yeah. She, she was, yeah. She, she was, was trying to hurt him in order yeah. to like end it because that's what he obviously wanted because he called their love disgusting. And so he's relieved. And they decide again that they can't live without each other. So they start another secret relationship. But this time they start skipping classes every couple of weeks to go home and to be together. And they talk about the future and the, and about how after Willa graduates school and goes off to live her life, like the last one of the nest to mm-hmm. leave, that they'll leave the country and change their names and live together as a couple out in the open. So the next couple of months are really happy for them after they like, you know, have these like little secret getaways. They... Managed to get Kit a little happier. Like, Kit is more involved in the family and, like, has a really good relationship with Lockin for a few for a few weeks. And I'm things just waiting. Are, I'm waiting for the other shoe to drop. There, things <laughs> are so good that Lockin even makes a friend at school. <gasps> I know. <gasps> because Maya makes him so happy. <laughs> so cute. <laughs> so, um, Kit comes home one day with the news that he'll be going out on a school trip during Easter weekend. And Willa and Tiffin get invited to a sleepover at the neighbor's house. Oh. And their mother has been gone for weeks on end. And they, she called like a couple days before saying that she was going to be out for like a week with her boyfriend, which leaves Maya and Lockin alone for two whole days, 48 hours. And to say that they're excited is an understatement. So <laughs> this prompts them to finally consummate their relationship. And at this time, Lockin is 18 and Maya is 17. Okay. Only to be found immediately after by their mother standing in the doorway, screaming her bloody head off. I would too. If Mm. I were their (laughs) parents. So immediately mom is like, oh, my God, get off of my baby. Get off of my child. And Lockin's freaking the fuck out because he's like, oh, my God, how did she get there? Mom runs downstairs to call the police. Lockin goes and closes the door, gets Maya dressed, and he puts on some boxers. And he's like, look, we need to get our story straight. I need you to tell them that I raped you. Whoa. 
And she's like, no, I don't want to do that. And he's like, no, but you have to because you can tell them that I raped you. Say that you don't want to press charges. It happens all the time. And I'll be out of jail in a couple days and the kids will have somebody with them. Because if we say that we're both consensual, we're both going to get in trouble. So we need to have one of us here and it has to be you because I'm technically an adult in the eyes of the law. Like, he's being very pragmatic about this. I was going to say, that is very pragmatic, but that's also, like, freaking, like, curveball there. I know. Like, And she's freaking out. She's like, I don't know if I can do that. And he's like, no, you have to. It's the only way. So the cops come upstairs, and they take Maya out, and they put her in the kitchen, start questioning her, and they arrest Lockin. As he's walking out the door, he sees Kit crying in the corner. Because Kit was the one that told their mother. Because Kit knew about their relationship the whole time. He wasn't stupid. The only reason why he said something was because he thought that Lockin had told uh, Kit's teacher that he was afraid of heights and got him kicked off of the school field trip. So he literally did it out of spite. Oh my god. Like at this point, I was like, this stupid kid ruining people's but he's, lives but he he did it like out of he, he did it purely even, out of spite yeah but how old is he he's like 13. 15 13 so obviously you know that logic part of the yeah, brain we were talking like, about he clearly isn't yeah, fully he, developed he there he even tells lock in like as he's being marched out of the house like i didn't think that she was gonna call the cops i thought that she was just gonna get get like really mad at you and get you in trouble but wow. cops got called idiot Lockin gets interviewed at the at the police station and finds out that Maya has signed a statement that says that it was a consensual relationship because she doesn't want Lockin to go down for everything. So Lockin is in the jail cell and he's like, how how can I possibly get us out of this? I don't know what to do because Maya cannot like Maya. He he surmises that, you know, he's going to be tried as an adult. He's 18, so mm-hmm. he'll probably be in jail for the rest of his life because now it's incest. Now it's not a rape that is not going to get charged. It's an incestuous relationship, which, which is illegal. And it's, it's Wait, why wouldn't the rape get charged? Because he told her to say that she didn't want to press charges. In which case, it would just be like a slap on the wrist. Oh, because okay. Because they don't have a wit. Like, she's not a witness to... Or she not, is. Not a witness. She's... Wrong, poor choice of words. She's not... She's not coming forth as as the victim. Yeah. Okay. So now they're both about to get in trouble. The investigators tell him, like, you're facing life in prison. Maya is facing getting a couple years in jail and then coming and, like, getting released... Because she's a child. She's still, she's yeah, she's minor. 17. Mm-hmm. Um, so Kid is like, I don't want Maya to start her adult life with a criminal record. Because then she'll never, she won't be able to be around the kids. She will have to go be on her own and the kids will be alone anyway. So he's like, okay, I'm going to run away. I'm just going to, because I guess, so the way that they describe the jail cell is it's just big bars and there's like a, a top to it. Okay. And there's just like little spikes on the top. You know what I'm talking about? So, I'm sorry, Kit is running away or? No, Lockin is running away. Okay, you said He's Kit. He's in a jail cell. You said sorry. Kit, yeah. Lockin right, so... decides he wants to run away. Okay. He's in jail. And he's like, I'm going to make a, uh, a rope by tearing apart this plastic sheet and tying it together. And he it was he says he was really good at climbing rope in gym class. So, he's going to climb this rope and climb over and you know run out the door while the guard is down the other hallway making his rounds well he gets stuck and like as he's climbing up he can hear the guard coming back he's not quick enough so he decides the only way to truly free his whole family is don't don't tell it. don't don't say it to loop so we're going to we're going to move on. Nope, we have to. It's a thing. He slips a loop of the bedsheet around his neck and lets go and he dies thinking of Maya. And I was like sobbing at this point. I was like, "Oh my god." <laughs> so, there's an epilogue and it's about Maya and how um she's been struggling since Lockin's death. It's been I think it says 
yeah, it's a month. It's a month after his death, and they finally get his body, and they get to have a funeral. So it's the day of the funeral. <sighs> Maya plans to say goodbye to everybody one last time, except for her mother. Her mother, who's a bitch, refuses to go to the funeral. So it's just Maya and her three other siblings. I'm surprised the mother would let the kids go. Yeah. Yeah. So Maya plans to say goodbye to everybody one last time and then end everything because she feels that she can no longer live without Lockin. So she has a knife that she has tucked away in her sleeve. She's going to go from the cemetery to the park and end her life because she feels that she can't live like this anymore. Ultimately, after in a a very sweet exchange with Willa, she she knows that she can't let Lockin's death be in, in, be in vain mm-hmm. and that she must carry on for her younger siblings and be the caregiver they need because she's all that they have left. Um, so the book ends with the four remaining siblings walking hand in hand to the graveyard. See, I was going to say if she actually did go through with it, then suddenly Lockin would jump out and be like, oh, it was poison. Oh, no, it was poison. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, yeah. So what was the best worst part of the book worst part of the book was end i was crying yeah the well best... and the fact and the fact knowing going into it that the whole thing was taboo too like you yeah. you want to root for these people and it's it yeah it's hard and i'll get and i'll get to that actually now so what did i learn from the book so i actually wrote the author on i i uh dm'd her on instagrams i slid into her dm um i haven't heard back from her Tabitha what's up girl um but I asked her why she would write this because she really made it seem like they were always meant to be together like Maya and Lockin like continually talk about how they've never felt like brother and sister so they kind of make it seem like they were just born to the same mother by accident type of thing Mm. so like the way that they word it is the way that Tabitha writes the book really makes me want to root for them. And it really, it was heartbreaking at the end, like reading the end, because it was kind of just like they were truly in love. It wasn't like puppy love. They grew from this, from being in a terrible home situation and having to be parents. And they've just grown together rather than apart. You know what I mean? So they did what uh, Jamie and Cersei didn't. Yes. Because nobody cared about that death. Nobody that was cared about not, that death. That was not how that should have ended with them. Yeah. But, um, yeah, so I, I, like I said, it really messed me up in my brain because I was like, why am I upset? Why am I upset that they got caught? Why couldn't, why am I upset that they didn't get to live happily ever after? Like, why can't I like, rationalize that they shouldn't have been together yeah, to begin with? Yeah, but, I get it. It's because, because of the way that Tabitha wrote the book. Yeah, and it's speaking to your emotional state, not exactly. your logical state. Yeah. So, what character did I like the best least? Hated the mom. The fact that she was just completely absent, and whenever she was drunk, she was starting fights with her children and talking down to them and just generally being a terrible person. And then towards the end, she just wasn't there. Like, they wouldn't see her for weeks. Yeah. And it's kind of just like, you're 45 fucking years old and you can't take care of your children. Like, what the fuck is wrong with you? Get it together. Get it together. I did. I'm so proud of myself. I had a favorite word. Oh. I know. First for me. (laughs) My favorite word was taciturn. Oh, I like that word. Yeah. For those who don't know, it means reserved or... Communicate uncommunicative in speech, so like saying little. So, so they lock in. Yeah, yeah. They were like lock in is taciturn. And I was like, that's a cute word. <laughs> Would I recommend this book? Yes, with an asterisk. If you are triggered by the law and by taboo, the taboo and by suicide, don't read this book. But if you are not triggered by any of those things and yes please read this book it is so good it's so well written like i said it's written from the points of view of maya and Lockin, and they kind of just like intertwine intertwine with each other and it really tells an amazing story and it it was a roller coaster like especially because they were like let's be together let's not be together let's be together 
and now I'm dead. Are you ready to swoon? I'm ready to swoon. But yeah, so no, was, it was it was a good book. It was a yeah, it was roller coastery for sure. Nice. So that was my book, Forbidden Love. Corey, questions, s- comments, concerns? Uh, no, I don't have any. But our episode is about to take a very dark turn. Oh God! So I'm so sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, yes. Trigger warning. Obviously, we've already said trigger warning. But trigger warning for my portion, I would not. Mine was pretty tame. Yeah, yours was pretty tame, except for that um explosive. Ex- Explosive what encounter? What did you say? Explosive encounter. Exchange. exchange. Explosive exchange. exchange. You know, I wrote that in my notes because I was thinking, like, how else do I say he dry humped her until he ejaculated in his pants? Well, there you go. You just said it. But, but I was trying to. But be the cute. thing is, the thing is, is that your euphemism didn't work because my mind immediately went to the to like the, the other thing. Not the other thing, but like the actual deed. Yeah, 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 yeah. And they didn't even go that far. So yeah, they did at the end. I'm, but I mean, in that situation. Oh, in that situation, yeah. So they were like just calling it an explosive exchange was maybe a poor choice. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know how else to say it. <laughs> okay, all right. So I am going to start mine. I'm just going to get right into it. I brought my book. I don't think I actually need it, but I do have a quote later. Anyway. Uh, Are you going to tell me the reason why you brought Angry Orchards? Yeah. TM? Okay. Yes, of course. So my book is called Secrets in the Cellar, a true story of the Austrian incest case that shocked the world. Mine is true crime. Okay. Because when I thought about incest, incest, obviously, you know, we were originally with this theme, we were going to go for kind of a funny, like, lighthearted episode. This is not that. This is not that. <laughs> so it wasn't I was like, like that with my book. It ain't gonna be like that with your book. So I was thinking, I was thinking, why not just go all in and do another true crime story? And um, after this, I won't be on true crime for a while because I've done uh, like several true crime stories and in the run of this podcast so far. Like, yeah, yes. So, but we're all in this together. Nice. Okay. High school musical throwback. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> you got to get your head in the game, Kobe. Come on. Okay. So this book was written by John Glatt. It was written in 2009. Um, and John Glatt is a prolific true crime novelist. Now, I call him a novelist, even though this is a nonfiction work technically, because of his knack for embellishment. Um, clearly, obviously, we don't know how these people are feeling or what's actually going on in their head or what the dialogue actually is, um, which he doesn't get into dialogue, but he does talk about, you know, how certain characters are feeling at certain moments mm-hmm. throughout the, this journey, so to speak. And he, there's no way he would know how they are feeling. You know yeah. what I mean? So he's a novelist. Um, and since 1998, he has been public. He has published a new work every year for St. Martin's true crime library. Which Damn. so he's written a lot of true crime novels. That's a lot of death and nastiness to live in. A lot of nastiness. Oh shit. Um now he was born in London. London. <laughs> so another Londoner. And him and his wife Gail, uh, they spend the majority of their time between New York, the the Catskills, and London. So I guess they have a house in the Catskills. Where is that? In uh northern like New York state. Oh. Why do yeah. they call it the Catskills? The Catskills Mountains. Catskill Mountains. Catskills or Catskills? Catskills Mountains. Mm. Yes. Uh, it's like it's a very popular vacation spot. I've never been up up north. You should watch uh, The Marvelous Miss Maisel on Amazon. Oh, wait. No, I just told you to watch it, so you're not going to. Anyway, moving on. <laughs> moving on. Before we go on that tangent. <laughs> Again. <laughs> So this book was actually published a year after the story broke. So the story broke in 2008, and this book, within a year, was published. So he was on it. He didn't waste no time. So I remember now why I brought my book. (laughs) So um, he starts the book off with the definition of a vampire. What? (laughs) What the fuck? And um, Corey, this is supposed to be about incest, not vampires. (laughs) Just... Let me talk. Okay, let me okay. let me tell my story. Okay, God. <laughs> um, so, vampire is an evil spirit, is a corpse that rises at night to drink the blood of the living. 
So I think we all know what vampires are. Yeah, so. why did you give a definition? Because it doesn't, for, is it relevant? I mean, according to the author, it is. Okay. I tie into it at the very end. Okay. okay so okay, let's just okay, go on this okay. journey. I'm sorry. Let's just go on this journey. I, it's just like last episode where I have too many questions. Got it. <laughs> Got it. Uh, on in April of 2008, uh, on a Saturday morning, emergency services get a call in Austria, uh, in the town of Amstetten, that a sick woman is outside of an apartment complex. They rush her to the hospital, and while she's being treated, soon after her grandfather shows up, and her grandfather is saying that he has a letter from his daughter Elizabeth to take care of her 19-year-old child Kirsten. And uh, this is not the first time that Elizabeth has sent her grant her children to her grandparents to be cared for. I'm really sorry. You're sorry. I know this story. I know you know this story. Okay. Okay. I told I told you like a week ago that okay. you knew this story. Okay. Yeah. Okay. This is a very very yeah. yeah. No, I 100 percent know about this. Cool. <laughs> so, um, and the three other children, their names are Lisa, Monica, and Alex. This man's name is Joseph Fritzel. And his daughter, Elizabeth, had run away back in August of 1984 to join a cult. So you remember last... As one does. <laughs> <laughs> so you remember last week where I was like, oh, this could be a cult book too, because yeah. of the mention. Um, after it's clear that the doctors can't help Kirsten with such limited knowledge of, you know, just where she's been, what she's been through, you know, how to mm-hmm. diagnose the problems, the hospital implores that Elizabeth returns. And a week later... After the hospitalization of Kirsten, uh, Yosef calls the hospital again and says, hey, that his daughter, Elizabeth, has miraculously returned. She saw their plea on TV. She came back. Now, the police decide to question them. And because that ain't fucking sus at all. <laughs> and um, basically, uh, the police want to question Yosef and they want to question his daughter, Elizabeth, who just, you know, because at this point they're thinking, man, she's a terrible mother. Like, this is the fourth child that she's dumped on her her parents' doorstep to yeah. care for. And um, Elizabeth has two simple requests when she's confronted by the police. That her mother and her children not be in harm's way, and that she never has to see her father ever again. So, let's go back to the start of it all. Josef Fritzl was born in 1935 in Amstetten. And it's a small market town, 128 kilometers west of Vienna. And it is known for its apple cider and its pear peri, which is basically like an alcoholic pear cider. So hence why, hence the oh. apple cider drink tonight. That's yeah, why listeners, I, Corey showed up at my house with Angry Orchard apple cider. And I was like, why did you buy these? We don't drink these. And he said it was relevant. So now I know I why. Was, well, I would have gotten the pear cider, but I couldn't get it in time. So cool. Yes. Now, Yosef, uh, his parents divorced when he was four, and growing up, he idolized his mother, bingo, bango, Oedipus, and uh, although she beat him and humiliated him constantly, he actually grew up during the Nazi occupation of his town, and uh, he lived in the shadow of the Maurer death camp, and that had a deep impact on, on him and his psyche. Uh, he was seen as an intelligent but odd child with an eccentric mother. Now, going a little bit into the future, at age 16, Yosef got his first job in a neighboring city at a steel and ironworks factory. In his early 20s, he had taken to finding young women in the park and woods and exposing himself to them, just for the sexual thrill. Because <laughs> he liked exposing himself to people. And in 1956, he married 17-year-old uh, Rosemary. And uh, he chose, name. yeah, he chose her for her submissiveness. He wanted a wife who could bear him many children and not complain. Ick. Fucking yeah. ick. So they had a total of seven children together. And uh, during this time, he continued to expose himself. Uh, he had a run-in with police for attempted rape. And uh, he often took to spying on women. And one victim of his was quoted saying that he would ride around on his bicycle just staring at people. God, this guy. That's mad so creepy. that's so nasty, right? Ugh. Just like imagine Ugh. just somebody riding by on a bicycle slowly, just like ogling you. Ugh. Ugh. <laughs> um, Elizabeth was his fourth child with Rosemary, and she was born on April sixteenth, nineteen sixty six. Not that it's related, but that's my that's what uh, Carlos's 
birthday <laughs> the 16th april 16th not 66 <laughs> april okay, 16th so to say carlos ain't the, <laughs> in the <old. laughs> um no so uh his father quickly took um to her and was uncommonly affectionate to elizabeth mm. and he even went so far as to give her a nickname uh, which is something he hadn't done with his other kids mm-hmm. in late october of 1970 sorry Fritzl was convicted and spent one and a half years in prison for the rape and aggravated assault of a young nurse in her home. 1967 or 76? 67. 67. So a year after Elizabeth was born. Yes. Okay. Um, Coming out of prison, though, he had no problem getting another job. He got a job with a construction company um, and learned construction and concrete development. And it was later uh, found out that the job that the people who his employer knew about the rape conviction. Of course And they he still did. hired him. Because why wouldn't they? Mm-hmm. He only raped and ruined... I'm sorry. I'm, I'm going to get off my soapbox. Sorry. Yeah. Continue. Well, it gets, it gets worse. So he moved, he moved his family into his mother's three-story house in Amstetten, which at the beginning, it's mentioned how his mother, like how they had to scrounge a little bit and they had mm-hmm. to beg for food from neighbors because they didn't have any money. So I'm wondering how she had a three-story house on the busiest street in Amstetten. Because that's where it was. It, the house where everything takes place is literally dead center in Amstetten, pretty much. Interesting. Bunch of foot traffic, a bunch of people passing by. And everything I'm about to go tell you about, it all took place there. So um, he moved the family into his mother's three-story house. And he even later admitted to locking his mother up on the third floor and breaking up the windows so she could never see the outside again until she died in 1980. But that's uh, there's a little bit of iffiness there Mm -hmm. if he actually did that. He did eventually tear down that house and he built a new one, but he left the old cellar intact. Now, soon after Elizabeth's 11th birthday, this word starts getting very dark. um, Her father raped her for the first time after her 11th birthday. Um he was extremely possessive and he singled Elizabeth out when he doled out punishment to his kids. Uh, He had a very strong hand with his kids. Mm -hmm. Um, He was very domineering. And on October 31st, 1978, the town planning committee gave Yosef a permit to build what he told them was a nuclear shelter. Uh, He also was set to start building an apartment complex behind his house for additional income. This shelter would, in fact, become Elizabeth's ultimate nightmare. Oh, it had it had two entrances. Uh, one was eventually uh, one was hidden in the garden, and another one was through a hidden door under the stairs in the house. And there were eight locked doors with keypad entry in between. Oh my God! Yosef did all the work himself. His neighbors remember the constant sound of construction, but they uh, there was very little suspicion raised. And during her time in middle school, Elizabeth became fast friends with uh, two girls, uh, twins, Krista and Judda. I'm not going to try and pronounce their last name because I'm going to get it wrong. Um, Over time, Krista would notice that her friend Elizabeth did transform from an outgoing young girl to being very sullen and withdrawn. Um, She would excuse herself from sports to avoid showing her bruises. And it wasn't until much later that they found out why. Um, according to a brothel owner in a neighboring town, Josef Fritzl, um, who was a regular client could only ever achieve sexual release or his, um, how did you put it? Explosive Explosive exchange, exchange, uh, by having literal power over life and death. So he would ask the, uh, prostitutes to do stuff, the sex workers, sorry, the sex workers to do stuff. Um, and they eventually started to refuse to serve him. The, the sex workers yeah. did, um, but he had a he had a god complex, and his um, his sadomasochism was just to the extreme, basically. Uh, after in 1982, 15 years after his rape conviction, because they have this stupid thing in Austria, um, his criminal record was expunged. What? And he was now a full citizen with his rights restored, and this was 15 years after his rape. This conviction. makes me really mad oh it makes you so angry right i'm I like hope that's not still a thing i don't i actually don't know i should have looked that up i'm gonna look that up later. but essentially he got a fresh start and um in 1983 the beginning of 1983 elizabeth attempted to run away uh but three weeks later she was picked up 
Uh, the following summer, she got a job uh, at a hotel as part of the hospitality staff. She drank a lot. She always snuck out to me uh, meet boys, um, not for anything sexual, but she would always sneak out. And um, she was unfit to work in the morning. And her boss eventually threatened her to send her back home. And uh, after that, she cleaned up her act. But she did eventually have to go back home after that assignment was complete, after that job, because it was just a summer job. And then that fall in 1983, Yosef finished work on his dungeon. Oh, God. Uh, he called it his kingdom, and no one, not even his wife, could enter. And no one questioned it. And, um, yeah, so on another assignment away uh, from home for this catering school that Elizabeth <laughs> was doing, um, she connected with a man named Andreas, and they had a beef, beef, they had a brief but passionate relationship. However, there is an obvious lack of intimacy, um, you know, because of years of trauma. Mm -hmm. And uh, he wrote love letters to Elizabeth when she had gone back home, but her father intercepted him. And that was the final straw because he could see Josef Fritzl saw his daughter Elizabeth slipping away. Mm -hmm. um, in August 1984, Yosef asked his daughter to help him move something downstairs to the cellar. She reluctantly agreed. He chloroformed her and handcuffed her in the dungeon. And afterwards, he had his way with her repeatedly. Um, in the months after her disappearance, Yosef played the part of a concerned parent, uh, you know, consoling his wife, going to the police constantly, you know, asking if there's any updates about his daughter, this fucking awful person um but like just to speak on the psychology for a second so i watch a lot of criminal minds <laughs> um and they say that uh perpetrators offenders that go and insert themselves into you know police investigations they're usually the ones with like the huge god complex the sadomasochism oh, yeah. so i'm honestly i was like I'm not surprised. Yeah. Well, and the thing, I mean, like that's one very large side to it. But yeah. then also the other side is like he is a parent, so he didn't want. Yeah. He because, also didn't want to raise suspicion. It, he was trying to be smart about it. You but always he also, hear you always hear about like parents who don't care about their kids gone, going missing or having, you know, it's like the next yeah. the next two weeks later, they get like themselves a tattoo and they they're pictures of them out partying and stuff like that. And it's like, well, you never know how somebody's going to react in that situation. Yeah. But yeah, he was definitely trying to be smart about it. He would later have Elizabeth write a letter telling everyone not to look for her because she had joined a cult. Uh, he then actually drove to a faraway city and then mailed the letter back to them. So it had that postmark on it. Uh, police never once questioned any of Elizabeth's friends about why a young woman with good prospects had not only tried to run away before but now had run away again like they never questioned it and um when elizabeth turned 19 the search for her was called off because she was a legal adult at that point no. so it's just one very frustrating step after another over time yosef did pay her in small acts of kindness and this is kind of where stockholm syndrome set in a little bit mm -hmm. um he eventually unshackled her let her roam around uh he would give her clothes a blanket news of the outside world pictures of her brothers and sisters and in september of 1986 she got pregnant but she miscarried and as a punishment for her miscarriage the lights in the cellar were turned off for an indeterminate amount of time because of course she can fucking control that yeah um in 1988 she was pregnant again Josef Fritzl left his daughter alone, and uh, she gave birth to Kristen, her firstborn. And um, Josef Fritzl was not there with his daughter when she gave birth. Of course not. Uh, two months after that, literally two months later, she was pregnant again. Uh, this time she gave birth to a boy named Stefan, and like before, she went through the birthing process alone. Josef, on the other hand, was excited to start a second proper family with his daughter this makes me nauseous yes um in 1991 elizabeth because at this point i mean that's seven years later like mm -hmm. she's still down there um hasn't seen the light of day hasn't seen the light of day she gave birth and mind you listeners if you haven't heard this story this is this is a true story this is real this actually happened and um she gave birth to her third child uh lisa after begging Yosef to expand the bunker, 
Uh, they set to work on creating new rooms and passages, but Yosef made Elizabeth and her children dig with their own bare hands. Oh so if God. they wanted to expand, they had to dig with their own hands. Um, after Lisa's birth, Yosef decided to take her topside, though, to live as an adopted granddaughter. And the only reason he did this was for grant money provided by the government for adoptive parents. Are you fucking kidding me? Yep, I'm not. Uh, in 1994, Elizabeth gave birth to her fourth child, Monica, who, like Lisa, would also soon be taken topside. However, Yosef now learned that he can get even more money if he acts as a foster parent and not an adoptive parent. So instead of adopting Monica like he did Lisa, they're just foster parents for her. And he gets more money from the government. So he essentially told the government, like, yo... My Someone, daughter, my daughter is dropping these children off because yeah. my daughter's in a cult and she's dropping these children off at our front door. And like he would even like put he would put the child at one. I think one of them he put in front of the door. Another one he put in a stroller and then left and had his wife waited, him. waited until the wife found Rosemary found him. What the fuck? Yeah. When he couldn't make runs to get groceries or supplies for his second hidden family, uh, Fritzl actually took to stealing from his tenants in the apartment complex that he had built. Uh, he also diverted their electricity to power the subterranean bunker down there. It just, it's just, it's, oh my God, I can't even begin to describe, like, well, I, I mean. This is so fucking intricate. <sighs> One tenant, who was actually an old schoolmate of Elizabeth's, had smuggled a dog in, although there were no pets allowed, and he later remarked that his dog always went crazy around the garden. Uh, he was eventually evicted when the dog um, when the dog was discovered by Josef Fritzl, but the dog went crazy about around Josef as well, which fucking Ugh. yeah, of Ugh. course the dog Ooh, did. That gives me the chills. Um, Ooh, bitch. At this point, people in the town and news media were condemning Elizabeth for being a thoughtless and uncaring mother because she was abandoning her children, so to speak. And in April of 1996, Elizabeth gave birth to twins, Michael and Alex. Michael died a few days later due to breathing problems, and Alex was, like the two girls before him, taken above ground. Once again, Elizabeth was left with her two oldest children, Kirsten and Stefan. Um, oh, and here's the... He got, I think, every month for each fostered grandchild, the Fritzels got uh, 1500 in U.S. dollars and government subsidies. Oh, my God. Per child? I think so. The fuck? I think I had that right. Uh, Josef Fritzl would make frequent vacation trips also um, throughout these years. Because, of making bank off of his brood mare in the cellar. And he would go to Thailand um, to places that are notorious for sex workers. Uh, and he was known to um, he was known to pay not just women, but also boys in Thailand. Um, and his wife... Didn't know about any of this? She knows about some of this stuff. But not... not like, the, she didn't know about Elizabeth, but she knew about the she's, other she stuff? Was, she was heartbroken when Elizabeth left, and then she she even started condemning Elizabeth herself. Because, yeah. Yeah. Um, and she didn't know what Joseph Fritzl did in, in Thailand but on his vacation. But she knew about the Thailand vacations with the sex workers. She knew about the She brothel. didn't know about the sex workers, I don't oh, think. Okay. But she does know about brothels. Um, and she knew about the rape charge, too. She didn't leave him. She stayed with him. Um, now, at even at age 65, Josef Fritzl still frequent in clubs. Uh, at this point, a friend of his recognized Josef and Rosemary, who were in the club. And um, he said that Josef made his wife Rosemary watch as he had sex with one of the female workers there. Oh my God. Um, in 2002, uh, Elizabeth got pregnant with a seven for a seventh and final time. Uh, and she gave birth to Felix afterwards. Uh, Yosef stopped pretty much any and all sexual contact with his daughter because he was no longer attracted to him, to her. Cause she was too old. Cause she was too old. And he had hit that magic number of seven. Because that's how many kids this he had mother, with Rosemary. This motherfucker. Um, and this time, her new baby Felix would stay in the cellar. And that was in 2002. Um, the beginning of the end started in 2003 when Yosef's latest business venture uh, falls through and leaves him in a lot of debt. And over the course of that year, multiple fires are mysteriously started and he collects insurance money from them. Uh, he also had a lake. 
he had a retreat on a, a with like some camp, campground and stuff on a lake and at i think there were like three different occasions where fires were started and police investigated and he was getting insurance money so over 20 years of being bound to a damp and dark dungeon was starting to take a terrible toll on elizabeth and her children um Josef fritzel was 72 and by this time he was becoming more paranoid and losing his um quote unquote vigor he hatched a plan because he was going to get elizabeth and her three children out of the cellar uh, and he was going to do this by claiming that she was tiring of the cult and that their poor health was directly caused by their time with the mysterious religious sect. So in other words, literally, like he he was he was worried that he was not going to be able to take care of his second family with his daughter because he was getting up there in age. Mm-hmm. So he hatched this plan that they were going to return from their cult. And the reason they are so malnourished and they were in such poor health was because... Of somebody else. Because of this group that they were part of. Um, They had, at this point, you know, all, like, they were losing teeth. Um, I can only imagine because of vitamin D deficiency. They're mm -hmm. fucking underground. Um, Yes. uh, Elizabeth's hair was snow white at this point, too. Uh, It had originally been been red. She had red hair. Because she was, like, in her her 40s at this Uh, point? I believe so. I believe she's in her 40s. Like, 46 or something. Um, God. And... Uh, her oldest son, Stefan, had, or I guess continues to have a um, a permanent stoop in his figure because the cellar at the highest point was only five feet, five inches tall, and he was 5'9". Oh, my God. So at this point, though, Yosef is making these plans, and they fall through when Kirsten starts seizing, and her health starts failing rapidly, and she starts going crazy. Yosef finally agrees after like two or three days of this to send her to the hospital where she is diagnosed with multiple organ failure and she's put in a medically induced coma. After much pleading, Yosef finally allows Elizabeth, Stefan, and Felix out of the uh, cellar uh, because he's going to take Elizabeth to the hospital. Um, And like I said, this is after the doctors had implored that Elizabeth show up. And of course, this is when Rosemary is and the other kids aren't home. Because Rosemary also took yearly trips uh, to, I can't remember where, but I guess it was common for them to take, you know, vacations without each other and stuff. So he waited. He waited until Rosemary was gone. And he made Elizabeth and her children promise to stick to the cult story. This is 8,516 days, 24 years after Elizabeth had seen light of day for the last time so 24 years in that cellar um elizabeth met with the doctor to help kirsten and then of course like i said they're picked up by the police and the main focus was of course on her in the beginning because it's like why are you such a bad parent um after many assurances by the police she did finally tell her remarkable story and when yosef was questioned he maintained that no actual physical abuse was ever had although the incest was real and he had locked Elizabeth up initially to save her from drugs and bad company. Mm-hmm. And it was, it was for her own good. This motherfucker. So, but he claimed that he never had sex with her until she was, uh, until she was 17. He said he didn't, he didn't have sex with her until, until after she had been locked up, but she claims, and of course we'll continue to claim because her it, truth is the is because the truth. it happened yeah that at the age of 11 is when he started um the uh so here's where there's some some positivity the boys uh stefan and felix the two that were in the cellar the cellar ch- uh, children they were picked up to and taken to the hospital and they were so excited to be in a vehicle and to see the moon and the police uh, escort had to drive really slow because they were terrified of going fast on the road um, it's heartbreaking. I know, uh, but the but it the way the author describes it is like Felix in particular because he's very young still. Because um, he's only like what a, a year, two years old. Um, I believe he's like four or five. Oh, he's four or five. Yeah, I think so. Because uh, this is two thousand eight. He was born in. He was born in two thousand two. So yeah, he's like six. Um, but it, the way the author describes it is like he was just so excited to see yeah. the world, you know, and he didn't know any better. He didn't know that he had been 
literally kept from this. Yeah. Um, when Rosemary discovers the truth of what her husband Yosef had done, uh, she is hospitalized for extreme heart palpitations. Um, eventually, the police do find the cellar entrance, although they have to get Yosef to help them. And after the story broke, a sign was posted in front of the Fritzl house, which, like I said, is on the busiest street in town. And the sign just said, why did nobody notice? Why did nobody fucking notice? Um, the Fritzl family shunned all public attention. And this is actually not the only case in Austria, a recent case in Austria about a captive woman being held against her will and in a you know, diabolical mm-hmm. sort of situation. Uh, Natasha Kampusch, I can't say her, I'm sorry. Um, she, like Elizabeth, was held against her will mm-hmm. and she had actually escaped in 2006. And the man who had uh, in, who had imprisoned her jumped in front of a speeding train to avoid police. Fucking and she, coward. yeah, and she came forth and she basically said that because of Yosef's upbringing in Nazi occupied Amstetten that at the time of national socialism, the suppression of women was propagated and authoritarian education was very important. It's a ramification of the second world war that what happened to her and what happened to Elizabeth is directly tied to how Yosef was brought up with his controlling and abusive mother in uh, I mean, that makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah, and Nazi Austria. So uh, the Austrian government even brought in their anti-terrorism Cobra force to protect the privacy of the family at the clinic they were staying at. So basically, reporters were just clamoring to get just a picture of yeah. Elizabeth. And um, Yosef, and I don't even think there are any, I'm not sure there are any actual pictures of any of them. Good. Um, that just sounds awful. Yeah. And well, and it was very like it was detrimental to their their healing you know to yeah. them yeah so yosef was equal measure ravenous for the attention that he was getting from the media but also terrified for his life in prison uh the other prisoners had put a bounty on his head and other inmates nicknamed him satan mm-hmm. and a police officer at one point calls him morally subhuman and i, I put that in there because i was like yeah he's fucking more he's not even subhuman he's the lowest spec um during interviews and a psychological evaluation, Fritzl was cooperative, but he was a fucking liar about everything. Uh, investigators looked into the construction of the labyrinth beneath the Fritzl house, and all told, they observed an estimated 197 tons of earth had to have been moved to build it. And he made his daughter and his grandchildren slash children dig, dig expansions. It yeah, themselves well, with their dig dig parts of the expansions. Yeah. Uh, furniture was supplied, electrical work and plumbing was done, and this was all done by Josef Fritzl himself. Um, forensic analysts worked through everything in the cellar. They had to wear uh, oxygen tanks because the oxygen supply was so poor down there. Not surprised. Yeah. And uh, so the family was eventually given new IDs. And uh, Kirsten, she had been in this coma, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And on May 15, 2008, she woke, and she was set to make a full recovery. Good. Um, So there is a lot of rumors of Elizabeth going to the press and setting up interviews, but it was all unfounded, as the family was still undergoing intense uh, physiological and uh, psychological rehabilitation. Uh, And it was learned that while in prison, Yosef was suffering a heart condition, and he may not make it to trial. As soon as Elizabeth learned that, she sought to be interviewed by the uh, prosecution ASAP as soon as possible because she wanted to see him go down for this. I would, too. But it was later decided that she was unfit at the time. Um, Meanwhile, her father was busy writing his memoir. Um, It's also said that he had hired a lawyer to turn his old house into a tourist attraction to help fund his defense. This fucked up man. Oh, my God. Um... Rosemary was eventually evicted from the clinic uh, due to her passive behavior for her over 50 years of, uh, of her relationship with Yosef. Essentially, Elizabeth was like, you know, you may be a, a fine mother to my grandkids and to my brothers and sisters, but you were an awful mother to me because you, you gave up on me mm-hmm. and you let him do all this. You stayed by his side, even through his rape charge in 76. 
Like she like, knew yeah. what kind of person he was and she chose to overlook it. She chose to stay with him. Yep. And uh, prosecution in the meantime, uh, they were debating getting a harsher sentence for Yosef. And they actually cited paragraph 104 of the Austrian Penal Code claiming that Yosef was voluntarily keeping his daughter and uh, children slash grandchildren, whatever you want to call them, as slaves which would constitute a harder, harsher sentence because I believe just for rape and negligence, I believe the sentence was only like 15 years max. And uh, so they wanted to get him for life. So um, they're going to charge him for slavery as well. And Josef Fritzl eventually was convicted of rape, murder, slavery, incest, and abuse on November 13th, 2008. Good. I'm glad that he was founded for murder for the the twin. Yeah. Ultimately, everything he did can be, according to one doctor, uh, can be explained by what he experienced himself. Uh, and this was quoted by Dr. Keith Ablau, a well-known forensic psychiatrist who assisted the author. And the reason there is a tie-in with the vampires is because this Dr. Ablau says that uh, he sees a comparison between vampires of literature, and he sees it as a fitting metaphor here because, as and I quote, he is feasting on the emotional lives of others because he lacks that core empathy and emotion himself. And the way you get to be a vampire is that you get bitten by another one. So that is the question. Who was the vampire that bit Josef Fritzl? So it's like, was it his mother? Was it Nazi, you know, Nazi Austria? What was it? The Mauer death camp? Like, what was it? Um, And that's it. So he goes down. uh, They're all living in privacy and secrecy. Uh, Where's Yosef? Yosef Fritzl is still alive and still currently serving out his sentence. I hope he gets the shit beaten out of him every single day in prison. I hope he goes the route of Jeffrey Dahmer and gets killed, honestly. Jeffrey Dahmer is murdered. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I thought you meant Jeffrey Epstein. No. Because Jeffrey Epstein didn't kill himself. No, he did not. Hashtag. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm... Worst part? Let me just get through my now. Yeah, go well, ahead. Do you, hold on. You go ahead. Well, no, I was going to say I, I'm glad that Elizabeth got her justice. Yeah. Every victim of sexual assault, every victim of a monster deserves to have their justice. I'm glad that she got that. I'm glad that the kids are okay. Yeah. Like, I was really I mean, they're, nervous for for Kirsten there. Yeah. So. No, I, I know. Um, so, best, worst part of this book. Worst part was the sadistic fuck who did it. The whole fuck fucking thing. Did it. <laughs> the sadistic fuck who literally caused this book to even be written in the first place. Um, the best part, it had a semi-happy ending, a silver lining ending, if you will. Yeah. I mean, while they're all going to be traumatized for the rest of their lives because of this. At least they're alive and at least they're together. And yeah. Um, what did I learn from the book? Apparently vampires are incestuous. I don't don't know. (laughs) Uh, and then, uh, sadomasochism I chose as my word for the book because it just, it describes this man like Mm -hmm. exactly to a T what he was. Um, and a uh, character that I like the best, uh, well, Elizabeth is a, a very strong woman. Yes. She, she, Elizabeth is a very incredible through, strong woman. Through all of it, she, she, stayed, she stayed positive for her kids. That, you know? And that is an amazing mother. It's an amazing, yes, it is. Um, how does this book compare to others? I don't know if you remember, I read Winter of Frozen Dreams for our Christmas episode yes. back in the day. This is much darker than that. Yes. Um, so, you know, that's really all I can compare it to. Uh, would I recommend this book? No, I wouldn't. Um, the book is good, but there are podcasts and news articles that will give you all the information you need. Um, this book is highly detailed and it's very upsetting that way. So if you are also a little bit of a masochist, then yeah, I guess you can read this book, but you can get all the details you need without getting into the nitty gritty of it. I would, yeah. I would suggest not getting into the nitty gritty of it. It's one of those things where it's like, the book was good. Don't get me one, wrong. It's one of those things where like, yeah. you don't want to know the details. Like, yes, it happened. It's, it's 
it, it's a reality. I think I think knowing that it actually happened is why I wouldn't want to know the details. I love yeah. I love gory movies. I love yeah. I love things like that. If this was a fiction work, I would have eaten it up and I would have been terrified and I would have been like cringing and just shivering from finishing it. I personally would not have been able to get through that. But, I'm glad I did not read but that. But the fact, yeah, but the fact that, you know, this actually happened just makes it all that much more worse. Like just because the whole time you're just thinking of Elizabeth and the children and how terrifying this whole thing must have been. And yeah. And I didn't remember with, with uh, Kirsten, I didn't remember if she had made it or not. And at the beginning of the book, it tells you she goes into a coma 300 pages later is when you find out she makes it. So you have to read through the whole book just to find out that Kirsten, she survived and um rude. Uh, <laughs> <That's> rude. <laughs> um and also well and that's how i did my notes too mm-hmm. said at the end uh also it is unclear whether or not joseph fritzel had turned his attention to kirsten after he was tired of his daughter so there there are those who yeah. speculate that he did but there's I mean, also no there's there's also no proof um i don't think they couldn't do they, when Kirsten was in a in her coma, there was there was some throwaway bit from the doctor about how he couldn't check to see if there was any emotional or not emotional sexual trauma there. Yeah. Um. So I'm not sure. And even if even if you know we could find out, I think that it's it's good for it's good for Kirsten for the it to be not publicized. Not publicized. Yeah. She has enough trauma. They She's all have got enough, enough trauma. They've got all got enough shit going on. But yeah. statistically, sexual offenders do not have just one victim. No, and he didn't. He had yeah, multiple and he victims. Had obviously but multiple, he, so it wouldn't be surprised. It wouldn't be surprising. I don't want to know about it. Yeah, I don't want to either. I don't think she wants anybody to know about it. It's bad enough that Elizabeth's life got put on blast. I feel bad for these poor people that have to change their identities in order to live their lives. Yeah, it's awful. And I don't know if there's like some way that y'all are listening. I doubt it because why would you listen? Why would you listen to us? Yeah. But um, y'all are strong. Y'all are amazing. Stay positive. This goes I'm so sorry that this happened to you because it fucking sucks. And that's the only way you could possibly yeah. express this- your sympathy for that. Yeah, and this goes above and beyond just Elizabeth, you know, just any 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 victims out there. Like any victims of sexual assault, of incestuous relationships, of non-consensual yes, sexual non-consensual rela- sexual keyword relationships. There. It sucks. I'm so sorry. It's wrong. And there are people in your corner. Yeah. And I know I know I'm it's hard corner. to see it's hard to see the light, you know, especially when it's happening, but mm-hmm. But yeah. God, this was fucking awful. Episode. I'm sorry. So, <laughs> it's okay. I actually think it was a very good episode. I mean, it was a good episode. The that topic it's was yeah. so touchy. Oh man. Oh, my God. So, if you were listening and you have stuck with us uh, through it all, thank you. You're wonderful. Thank you so much. You're amazing, beautiful, amazing people. <laughs> You're effervescent. You're effervescent as fuck. <laughs> oh, I swoon I love for you, folks. you. I swoon for you. Okay, well that roller coaster ride is done. So <laughs> roller coaster ride. <laughs> so um, next episode, we're doing booked on discrimination, which, which is essentially about racism. I mean, it's it's topical. It's very. I mean, sadly, sadly, off, it's yeah. topical. We wanted to talk about it. Yeah, I ain't doing a true crime for that one. Yeah, I'm not either. Mine is a fiction. Actually, I'm super excited. There's too excited. much true crime going on I am on right super now. excited uh, for the book that I'm doing next week. So, Honestly, so am I, because it's weird. So. Really? So uh, stay tuned. Come back next week. Please come back. Yes. I'm sorry. Please come back. Please come back. <laughs> well, we're going to do a lot of lighthearted now. I told yeah. you, I'm staying away from true crime for a bit now. The so. next few episodes, I promise, it's going to be funny. All right. Okay. Well, well, thanks for listening. Thank you. See you guys next week. Bye. Bye, folks. Bye. Bye.